Uh, welcome to today's meeting uh, being held by the Committee for Public Education, the CFPE. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Connor. I'm going to chair the meeting today. I'm a public school teacher, a uh, member of the CFPE, and also a national committee member of the Socialist Equality Party. Just to explain the format of today's meeting, we have three speakers, uh, Sue Phillips and Carolyn Kennett from the CFPE here. And we're also very pleased to welcome from the United States, Renee Casameda. I'll introduce each of those speakers in more detail after some making some brief uh, opening remarks. Uh, but following the three reports, we're gonna open up the meeting for questions and discussion. And we very much welcome everyone here to uh, speak, uh, share your experiences, um, especially or including if that's as a, a teacher or ES or school worker. Uh, after the discussion period, we'll conclude the meeting with just a couple of brief announcements. Now, this public meeting that we're holding today is the first that has been convened by the CFPE since the federal election of May 21. The result of the election was marked by broad and intense hostility to the entire political establishment. As we know, the despised Morrison government was thrown out of office. This was amid escalating anger over numerous issues, too many to go through here. Uh, but certainly not limited to its in indifference to the suffering caused by the national bushfire crisis, its culpability in the related climate change catastrophe, and its total failure to enact any basic public health measures that impinged on corporate profits in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Labor Party, however, proved unable and unwilling to develop and utilise this hostility towards the former government. It has scraped into office with just 33% of the primary vote, a record low, and indeed a record historic low vote for the major parties combined. Now, what has come to office is the most right-wing Labor government in the post-World War II period. On international policy, Anthony Albanese and his colleagues have sought to position themselves as the most ruthless and reliable allies of the United States. Far from Morrison, as anticipated, whipping up a so-called khaki election campaign, it was in fact the Labor Party that centrally raised the Solomon Islands sovereign governments and totally lawful diplomatic relations with China as a major issue to be addressed. And this was part of a uh, campaign bound up with the aggressive US-led confrontation of Beijing. Even before votes from the federal election were fully counted, and even before it was clear that Labor had secured a parliamentary majority, Albanese and others flew to Japan for the quad discussions with President Joe Biden. Now taken together, what all of this signals is the Labor government's determination to fully support the agenda of militarism and war that centers on Washington's preparations for devastating military conflict with both Russia and China. And this was very much underscored just the other day when the Labor government responded to the British government's decision to approve the so-called extradition of Julian Assange, uh, the editor of WikiLeaks, uh, to the United States on trumped up charges under the, under the Espionage Act. Uh, the Labor government has continued uh, it, the record of its predecessors, both Labor and Liberal, in totally washing its hands of any responsibility for ensuring the safety of this principal journalist. Now at home, the Albanese government has assumed office at the same time as the economic and social crisis is sharply intensifying. Escalating inflation is eroding the real wages of the working class. Interest rate hikes are threatening numerous mortgage holders with the loss of their homes, if not outright destitution. And now corporate operators of privatised electricity networks are threatening to impose blackouts unless higher profits are guaranteed. The situation is unravelling with rapid speed. The crisis in Australia is at one component of a broader global breakdown in economic, political and geostrategic relations. Previous claims of Australian exceptionalism that this country was somehow immune from or less affected by the international capitalist crisis have been shattered in the last period. And taken together, all of this is the context within which we are today discussing the disastrous situation, the untenable situation within the Australian school system. The Committee for Public Education was formed in 2017 uh, by members and supporters of the Socialist Equality Party, which is the Australian section of the International Committee of the Fourth International. Uh, the CFPE has sought to develop the widest fight for the establishment of a fully funded, universally accessible public school system so that everyone, and not just the families of the ultra-wealthy, can access the highest quality education. We've also actively intervened into the COVID-19 crisis. The CFBE has called on all teachers and school workers in Australia to form action committees, independent of the trade unions, and develop the widest democratic discussion 
on the necessary measures to protect the health and well-being of education workers and students. We recognise that not a single step forward can be taken while teachers remain trapped within the education unions, uh, the Australian Education Union, the AU, and its state affiliates, including the New South Wales Teachers' Federation. These unions share responsibility for the sweeping privatisation of the education sector over recent decades by successive Labor and Liberal governments, and they have imposed countless sellout industrial agreements that have led to the untenable working conditions endured now by teachers. Many of these issues are going to be developed further in the course of the discussion today. To introduce our first speaker, it is Sue Phillips, who is the National Convener of the Committee for Public Education. Uh, Sue is a long-standing public school teacher working within the Victorian primary system for several decades. She is also a long-standing member of the Social Equality Party and serves on the party's national committee. And I'm very pleased to welcome her to open up our meeting today with the first report. I would like to welcome everyone to the meeting, in particular any teachers and educators participating. We know how precious every minute is at the end of a gruelling second term with school reports, exams to mark, parent-teacher meetings and all the rest, all to be completed in our own time. As Patrick said, we encourage everyone online to share your experiences, comment and ask questions in the meeting. We're only six months into 2022, yet the year has involved significant experiences for teachers and school workers throughout Australia, as has for the working class more broadly, both here and internationally. With my report, I hope to provide an overview of some of these experiences, including multiple portrayals carried out by the teacher unions and to outline a perspective advanced by the Committee for Public Education. Last December, teachers in New South Wales took strike action, the first authorised by the New South Wales Teachers Federation in more than a decade, over an unresolved industrial agreement. Just weeks later in South Australia, teachers voted overwhelmingly to strike at the beginning of Term 1 due to lack of COVID mitigations in the schools. Fearing growing anger among teachers spreading across state borders, within days, the South Australian Education Union called off action after negotiations with the state Labor government. This coincided with an unresolved industrial agreement in Victoria. Among teachers, parents and the community, broad concerns began emerging over, over the COVID situation, with governments embracing a letter RIP policy, with schools as key sites to open, getting workers back into the workplaces for profit. Critically, behind the scenes, an alliance was being hatched between Daniel Andrews, the Victorian Labor Premier, and New South Wales Liberal Premier, Dominique Perrottet. This was overseen by Prime Minister Morrison to force the reopening of face-to-face -face teaching in all schools. Now, for those not familiar that's online with Australian politics, Andrews is sometimes described in the media as a member of the socialist left of the Labor Party and Perrottet a right-wing Christian fundamentalist. While different parties, they have the same program. As Andrews has recently said, quote, we get things done. And, of course, what he meant by that is done in the interests of business. Andrews reported in December he had been texting back and forth with Perrottet. They had resolved to, quote, keep our rules the same, and to, quote, that is to proceed in lifting of all the COVID safety restrictions. This unholy political alliance and conspiracy against the population was blatantly summed up in a speech by Perrottet to business leaders at the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. Perrottet explained that his partnership with Andrews had been the central factor in allowing the governments to begin the new stage of the reopening in late January, early February. The centrepiece was the herding of millions of students and teachers back into the classrooms. Perrottet said he and Dan had worked together on a daily basis. 
They had devised a a tag team act. If there were criticisms of the reopening policies of Perrottet, he could point to identical measures being implemented by Andrews, who was previously associated with limited public health restrictions. Andrews, meanwhile, could present his lockstep march with Perrottet as proof to business that his later day conversion to the Let It Rip program was sincere. Now, we'd like to just show a short part of his address to uh, the business group. You know, we ended up bringing QR codes back when we weren't even tracking and tracing. Uh, there was no science behind it at all. It had zero utility. Uh, but there was a massive campaign, and when those massive campaigns get run, what it does, it depletes confidence. And that kind of reporting, as we've seen over this period of time, has depleted confidence in our people. So we actually brought it back for one reason only, to instill confidence so that people would go out with um, using, using QR codes. But where Dan and I reached that agreement was if we could come out on the same day with the same settings, whilst he would get attacked for not going far enough, uh, and I'd get attacked for going way too far, we could work with each other to say, well, go look at Victoria, and he could say, go look at what Dom's doing in New South Wales. And it worked perfectly, um, that, I think, that relationship, particularly with schools going back, um, where we reached agreement on schools. I mean, when we announced schools going back, you know, the media would rush to find the, the, the scariest uh, epidemiologist who was out there saying every child across New South Wales would die. Um, and that was a problem because we had to instill confidence. So what did we do together? We agreed that we'd go and get all these uh, rapid antigen tests, which was a massive feat. I mean, we, had to procure, we procured millions of these tests uh, to, and, and had the plan together where um, we and, and distributed them to, before school started to 3,000 schools across our state and 5,000 uh, childcare and early childhood education centres. Uh, and by doing that together and having that plan, and here's another interesting thing about the pandemic, health completely disagreed with this approach, by the way. Um, they didn't see the point of having surveillance testing, but education wanted it because we needed to once again instill confidence in our teachers and instill confidence in our parents that children would be safe at school. And New South Wales and Victoria, once again, a liberal state and a labor state, having exactly the same policy in the main, uh, really built that confidence in so when those reports came in, those concerns came in to parents, um, that there was that sense that, well, if it's good enough for New South Wales and it's good enough for Victoria, I have greater confidence. I have greater confidence in the approach. Um, and what, are we, what have we seen since then? I think one of the most important successes um, over this period of time, because we both agreed, Dan and I, that it wasn't just about educational outcomes for our kids. Getting kids back in the classroom on day one brought back normalcy to life. In February, at the beginning of this year, the schools opened in conditions of an Omicron surge, infecting thousands, something that was fully anticipated, as we see from Perite, by governments and fully endorsed by the union. Fearing opposition to the reopening and possible strike action of teachers in New South Wales and Victoria over industrial agreements, Everything was done by the unions to block such an occurrence. At the beginning of Term 1, the New South Wales Teachers Federation announced that all strike action would be postponed as an act of good faith with the Perite government. The vast majority of teachers were kept in the dark of this decision. The New South Wales Teachers Federation no-strike pledge from Angelo Gabrielatis was, quote, to give the Premier and the New South Wales Government an opportunity to engage in genuine negotiations with the union. This pause and act of good faith provided the Government with an unparalleled opportunity to resolve the matters regarding teachers' salaries and workload by negotiation and mutual agreement. Now, this same no-strike pledge from the union was enforced again this May after the second strike of teachers in New South Wales, one of the biggest ever actions of teachers. With a sellout industrial agreement just rammed through in Victoria involving substantial real wage cuts for teachers, 
This points to what will emerge unless the struggle is taken out of the hands of the New South Wales Teachers Federation bureaucracy. On January 31, day one of term one, the AU in Victoria suddenly announced a lifting of very limited and ineffectual work bans that had been imposed over the then unresolved industrial agreement in the state. Four months earlier, in a statewide ballot in September, 97% of the AU membership voted for industrial action. This was ignored by the union. And of course, the last time any industrial action had been taken by teachers in Victoria is since 2013 when the biggest three, the three biggest strikes ever took place. Since the election of Andrew's government in 24, all industrial action by teachers has ceased. On February the 2nd this year, we noted on the World Socialist website, quote, in shutting down these restricted measures on the first day of term, of term in 2022, the AU was sending a calculated message to the state government and the ruling elite more broadly. As the schools are forced to reopen amid dangerously high levels of COVID-19 infection in the community, the bureaucracy will do everything within its power to suppress opposition among teachers and school workers. Not even the most constrained forms of industrial action will be permitted while coronavirus rips through the school. Now, within days, the AU announced its industrial deal with, state Labor with the state Labor government that was claimed by the union as an historic achievement, but more aptly described by the Committee for Public Education as a monstrous betrayal. The deal of less than 2% wage rise represented a substantial real wage cut. This is under conditions of growing cost of living rises, interest rates escalating, and in, in a situation where the head of the Reserve Bank mentioned this week that inflation is set to rise to 7% at least by the end of the year. In addition to a considerable wage cut, the deal did nothing to address unbearable and unsustainable sustainable workload, nothing on class sizes or contract teachers. And as I said, this is in the midst of COVID surging through the schools, exacerbating an already a severe staffing crisis. What has been created is educators are reaching breaking point, burnt out, stressed, and leaving the profession in droves. And, of course, this is an international process. While a deal immediately affects educators in Victoria, it has implications for other educators nationally and sets a dangerous precedent, in particular for New South Wales educators who are still in the midst of the fight for a new agreement. As Patrick mentioned, it comes after the federal election of the Albanese Labor government, who has already made clear the need for an austerity program to pay the $1 trillion debt with stepped up demands for worker productivity and sacrifice and with in literally hours of being elected, openly lining up with the US war drive against China. Very significant opposition was registered against the AU Labor Agreement. And I want to review briefly how the union only narrowly managed to secure majority ratification of the deal. Within hours of the announcement, teachers understood it as another sellout and hundreds went onto the AU Facebook page outraged, condemning the deal. The union's response was immediate with the, with the, with the deletion and the blocking of comments and outright censorship. This was consistent with the union's previous record. In 2021, this included threatening to throw teacher members of the CFPE out of AU regional meetings for so-called disorderly con conduct solely on the basis that bureaucrats were being questioned and challenged. 
and in other online meetings, union bureaucrats desperate to stifle discussion and debate bureaucratically disabled the chat box, keeping participants on permanent mute and preventing people even raising their hand. The CFPE opposed the AU Labor deal when it was unveiled, posting statements on February the 2nd and February the February the 2nd and February the 7th, calling for a no vote for the formation of rank and file committees to take forward a political and industrial campaign. Opposing union censorship, the CFPE established a Facebook group to provide teachers with the opportunity to participate in a democratic and uncensored discussion and debate, sharing experiences and information. Within weeks, the page had hundreds of members, now more than 800. <clears throat> In the following weeks, the deal was pushed through statewide delegates meetings with CFPE members intervening, distributing our statements and reporting in articles on the World Socialist website the anti-democratic methods adopted to suppress any oppositional voices. Teachers in our Facebook group reported the outcome of meetings, shared information, including telling votes. The final delegates' vote was only narrowly passed with nearly 40% voting no. Fearing this opposition, the union launched a propaganda campaign of misinformation, visiting schools, attempting to coerce educators that this was a great deal. The operation included a series of emails to members from Meredith Priest, Peace, the union pre president, demanding that all union members must vote yes. Now, for many teachers, this was the final straw. Teachers resigned from the union, posting their resignation letters on our Facebook group, describing the role of the union as having, quote, a totalitarian stench, union bureaucrats, bureaucrats as, quote, imperious overlords, and others describing the union as, quote, arrogant, adopting bullying, undemocratic and dictatorial methods, and applying outrageous strong-arm tactics. The final stage of the ratification of the agreement was the ballot of all school staff that is union and non-union members, carried out at the schools. It was counted by school principals and a union delegate, if one existed in the school, and then forwarded to the Department of Education, that is to the employer who tallied the statewide vote with no independent oversight. Now, this would be akin to sending the contract ballots of Amazon workers to G to Jeff Bezos to count. So that the vote could not be challenged, schools were directed to destroy all ballot papers. As the CFPE stated in its June 3rd statement, quote, the bureaucratic method with which the agreement was imposed is inextricably linked to its reactionary content, end of quote. Many teachers have challenged the veracity of the vote count itself. The record no vote at delegates meeting and the final ballot recording the rejection of the deal by more than 38% of all school employees, that is 20,000 educators, is a powerful expression of opposition emerging amongst teachers, university workers nationally and internationally. So substantial and unprecedented has been the numbers of teachers resigning from the union that this week the Age newspaper published an article highlighting the resignations. The Age article received 446 likes and hearts and 294 comments, virtually 99% of them opposed to the union sellout. Many of the hundreds that have resigned from the union did it in anger and frustration about the treachery of the union. They saw resigning as a protest, some with the intention of hopefully pressuring the union to change course or, might, or maybe throw out the present leadership 
and elect a new one. The critical lessons of the last year and the previous decades analysed by the CFPE prove that such a perspective is dead end. Far from the union's representative of a collective representing a collective defence of jobs, wages and conditions, the reality of the situation is the opposite. The union works in complete partnership with governments no matter what political party. It doesn't unite educators and school workers but divides and isolates them. It doesn't fight for improved conditions but imposes the dictates of business organising defeat after defeat. The AU campaign for the agreement was not a mistake, weakly devised or the result of poor negotiating skills, but consciously planned by the AU bureaucrat. It was aimed at imposing the demands of the Labor government, blocking any industrial action and making sure that there was no possibility of a unified struggle with teachers in other states such as New South Wales or South Australia. Above all, its purpose was to straitjacket and silence any opposition, in particular from the CFPE, which the union is fully aware represents the only real politically organised opposition. In opposition to the various pseudo-left organisations such as Solidarity, Socialist Alliance and Socialist Alternative, who fight to keep teachers tied within the union framework and promote the lie that unions can be democratised, the CFPE has fought for the independent action of teachers in opposition to the union. The union bureaucrats who share direct responsibility for the crisis of public education comprise an affluent upper-middle-class layer with senior officials receiving a quarter of a million dollars in annual salaries. These privileges are earned by enforcing the demands of the financial elite and in collaboration with federal and state governments against the interests of school workers. This is not just a question of the AU in Australia. Internationally, over the past two to three decades, there's been a transformation of the old organisations, the trade unions and the Labor parties. These are now right-wing instruments of big business and the conditions of the globalisation of the profit system within which capital finances are free to roam the globe in pursuit of the most profitable environment. The trade unions have nowhere responded by defending workers' conditions but rather have collaborated with the destruction of jobs, with the suppression of wages and with the tearing up of conditions. This is an international process. Lessons must be drawn out of this immediate experience and the decades of betrayals. Teachers and workers must begin to take matters into their own hands. New organisations of struggle must begin to be formed in the workplaces building a network of rank-and-file committees independent of the trade unions. Democratically organised and led by trusted educators, school workers and parents that will fight for the unity of educators and turn out to other sections of workers, health workers, academics, bus drivers, all of them who are confronting attacks on jobs, wages and conditions and take forward the necessary political and industrial struggle for a fully funded and resourced public education system. Now, in the course of the recent campaign, AU campaign and New South Wales campaign, the CFPE have developed a series of demands that will be the basis of such a struggle. Now, we have a whole series, but I just want to point just to a couple. An immediate cross-the-board pay increase to compensate for previous inadequate wage deals. Salaries fully indexed against inflation with automatically monthly cost of living adjustments to ensure no educator is worse off in the future. 
hire thousands of teachers and education support, support staff to end the current huge workloads and staffing crisis. Maximum class sizes of 18 to 20. End the burden of administrative tasks. Halt the privatisation of Australia's school system. No more public funds for elite private schools. Pour billions of dollars into public education to reverse the decades of underfunding and provide free high quality education to every child. Now, a fight for these demands immediately raises political issues. The AU Labor government agreement in Victoria was driven by the financial elite's push to make workers bear the burden of an unprecedented COVID-triggered debt and deficit crisis. Alongside the necessary lockdown restrictions that were implemented in 2020, the state Labor government funneled billions of dollars to corporate interests, resulting in a $200 billion state debt and a $19.5 billion deficit. Now, this is a sharp forewarning about the program of the Albanese government, who have already issued statements of, quote, dire economic challenges and black holes to justify a pro-business austerity program. This domestic agenda goes hand in hand with the promotion of militarism and more and with the Labor government's top priority internationally supporting the United States' aggressive confrontation of both Russia and China. The CFPE rejects outright the calls for sacrifice and any claims of governments, unions, the media or all of those who defend capitalism that there is no money. Billions are being found to buy nuclear submarines, to pour and prosecute the war, but nothing, a mere pittance for public schools. There are resources which are all produced by the working class, but they are in the hands of the corporate and financial elite. We call for the nationalisation of the banks, mining companies and major corporations under democratic workers' control so as to meet the pressing social needs of the majority, not the profits of the wealthy few. This means a fight for a socialist perspective. The Committee for Public Education and the Socialist Equality Party will offer every assistance to teachers, students, parents seeking to begin the process of establishing rank and file committees as part of the formation of the International Alliance of Rank and File Committees. Above all else, we urge educators and other workers to contact us, continue the, the discussion and above all, join our ranks, ranks, become active and help to develop the necessary political and industrial campaign that is urgently required. Uh, thank you, Sue, for that opening report. Covers many important issues that hopefully we'll get to come back to during the discussion portion of the meeting. Uh, we'll move to the second speaker today, which is Carolyn Kenner. Uh, Carolyn's going to be speaking on the surging uh, COVID infections throughout uh, the country, including within the schools. Uh, Carolyn is a university lecturer from Sydney, uh, where she teaches mathematics and statistics. She is also a member of the CFPE and the Social Equality Party. Uh, she stood as a candidate for the SEP in both federal and state elections, and she helps write on education issues for the World Social website. So I give a warm welcome to Carolyn. Thanks, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> So welcome everybody to this meeting. Let me um, add my words of welcome. So um, I just wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about um, the situation with COVID, which uh, Sue has, pre has, has briefly mentioned. Um, so the pandemic, the global pandemic was both predictable and predicted, but ignored by every capitalist government. From the outset, the only concern by those same governments was driving workers back to work lifting lockdowns and restrictions and increasing profits. And this was a global phenomenon. It is for that reason that the reopening of schools became a focal point. If the schools are closed, then the parents of children can't work. 
So the demand is they open, irrespective of how many lives it costs of teachers, students, their families, and in the wider community. The effect of these policies has led to a public health disaster globally. Millions of people have died and millions more are suffering from long COVID. Out of a population of almost 26 million people in Australia, 7.72 million cases have been reported. That's more than 30% of the population. There have been more than 9,200 confirmed deaths um, with about 7,000 occurring just in the last six months. Newly reported deaths due to COVID in Australia have been above 40 a day for the last month. We are third in the death rates per million for countries with populations above 10 million. I cannot stress enough that the decision of the Australian government, supported by the Labor opposition at the time, to lift restrictions was not a mistake. It had been proven how the virus could be eliminated. From the end of September 2020 to October 2021, there were no deaths from COVID in Australia. The decision opposed by principled epidemiologists and many sections of workers, including teachers, was that in the interests of production, profit and wealth for a tiny few, the virus was to be allowed to spread, irrespective of the death toll, the vast majority of which has been incurred by the poor and the working class. In an interview with The Guardian newspaper, Professor Margaret Hellard, an infectious disease expert, warns that the country was on track to have 10 to 15,000 COVID-19 deaths in 2022. This is probably an underestimate. If the death toll remains above 43 per day, then the deaths will exceed 15,000. Hellard said in the interview, this kind of notion going around, that there's nothing that we've got to add or to offer, that things really can't be done, is actually incorrect. She went on to say that authority, authorities needed to pursue measures to minimise virus cases and deaths, including reintroducing masks in enclosed spaces, prioritising air quality, boosting vaccination coverage and maintaining virus testing and isolation. In this graph, what you can see is that deaths are rising. So you can see also that some, in, some, in some states, cases are beginning to grow. There is a new wave of infections coming. As the dominance of BA, the BA2 variant wanes, the new BA4 and BA5 subvariants are in a race to become the dominant variants. 35% of cases in Australia that were se sequenced recently were BA4 and BA5. The dominance of BA5 in Portugal is leading to a rapid rise in cases and excess mortality rates higher than at any time since the vaccination programs were enacted. A recent study from Japan found that BA4 and BA5 are more pathogenic than the BA1 and BA2 variants, and that vaccinations or previous infections from earlier Omicron variants provide very little protection against infection from BA4 or BA5. The implication is that most of the billions of people who have just been infected are now susceptible to reinfection with the new subvariants, and that these reinfections will more likely will be likely more severe. Yet mitigation measures such as man, mask mandates, contract tasting, and isolation periods for close contacts have been dispensed with across the country. In particular, masks are no longer mandated at schools for either staff or students, and close contacts of confirmed cases no longer need to isolate. As part of the living with the virus agenda, governments, both Labor and Liberal, have forced teachers back into the classroom for the sake of profits. And unions have enforced the reopening of schools and systematically suppressed teacher opposition to what is happening. At every instance, they have reinforced the government's line. Schools act as super spreaders of, the, of COVID. Last November, the Doherty Institute issued a report to National Cabinet on the effects of returning to face-to-face -face learning. You can see one of the diagrams from that, um, that report on the screen. And if I just get you to look at the left-hand column, what that was telling us is that if there were no mitigation measures, that up to 50% of, sing of single infections in schools will lead to a further 20 to 50 infections in the wider community. And that was before the highly transmissible Omicron was detected in Australia. So the governments knew that if they opened the schools and children were sick and went to school and there was no screening and no contract tracing, that that would result in massive infections uh, blooming out from those single infections. 
So as a result of the reopening policies pursued by both the Labor and the Liberal government, schools across the country are in crisis. Teacher shortages were a problem long before COVID as governments have ripped funding from public education and held teacher salaries low while ramping up the admin tasks. But the pandemic has pushed the system to a breaking point. An article recently published by Monash Academics found that 59% of teachers surveyed were planning to leave teaching. The reasons given by teachers included heavy workloads, health and wellbeing concerns for teachers and the status of the profession. The extent of the crisis has been covered over by both the government and the unions. One teacher reported to the CFP that primary school principals in New South Wales schools have been threatened by the education department with disciplinary action if they talk to the media about cohorts of students working from home or the number of classes collapsed due to staff shortages. Nevertheless, some schools are reporting staff absences of up to 40% on any one day, many due to COVID infections. And it's not just the teaching staff. Schools are also reporting increased student absences due to illness compared to previous years. School camps and assemblies are leading to mass infections. One teacher posted on Facebook, it's insane right now. My daughter has been homesick all week. Our school has had record numbers of absences with days that have been close to one third of the school away. Not all COVID, there's some flu and gastro around too. But for everyone to be just carrying on like this is normal is beyond belief. This is not normal. I've been teaching since almost 20 years and high absences over an extended period of time across every single school like this is unheard of. My own children are coming home sick constantly too. Uh, last week, um, several schools in the ACT would, uh, returned to remote learning, at least part of their cohorts. And you can see the ACT is one of the few places which is reporting on this information. While the numbers of students testing positive in schools are hidden from view in most of the states, cases in the under-19 age group are currently at about 20% of all new cases in Australia. That's 6,000 children being infected every single day. In a recent survey run by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, one third of Australian households with children under 18 reported that their child's attendance at school was impacted by COVID. Almost all of the impact was either due to being someone testing positive in the household or being a close contact of a case. In addition, the Bureau report noted that 10% of households with children under the age of 18 reported that their child had been required to learn from home if possible. Now, this was just at the end of April. So this was not in the surge at the beginning um, in February. So one-tenth of classes in the country are returning to remote learning for brief periods due to staff shortages and sicknesses. The ABS report also noted that a significant proportion of households, 12%, reported that they were unwilling to send their children to school or preschool due to COVID. What parents have been facing since governments forced students and teachers back into school has been horrendous. Parents struggling with whether to let their kids go to school or find some other workaround. Mask mandates have been junked in schools and many parents have expressed the difficulties of getting their children or their children's school to stay masked. And for parents of under fives, the situation is even more dire as there's not even been a vaccination available for them. And you can see on the screen at the moment um, from Twitter, um, a, a, an American uh, father of a one-year-old and three-year-old has listed the things that his children have missed out on while there hasn't been vaccinations vaccinations available. So it's holidays, birthdays, Christmases, weddings, babysitters, going out, all those things. And they're worried. And all parents are really, really worried about the impact that this is going to have on their fa on, on them. But they're also very, very worried about the impact of getting COVID and possibly ending up with long COVID, 10% of the population. And that's a conservative estimate. In January this year, the CFP issued a statement on the reopening of schools. In that, we said, in this third year of the pandemic, a rational and scientifically based approach to the virus is more urgent than ever. The protection of human life and safety must take unconditional priority over all co corporate financial interests. The CFP recognises that the only viable strategy is to work towards elimination of the virus through the adoption of the necessary measures as advised by leading epidemiologists and scientists. The only country in the world 
which has maintained public health measures to prevent COVID-19 from running rampant is China, where a zero COVID policy has saved millions of lives since January 2020. Most recently, Chinese society defeated Omicron BA2, which ripped through Shanghai and other parts of the country beginning in early March. As you can see, three months later, they have no cases. What did they do? Mass testing wherever outbreaks occur, rigorous contract tracing, safe isolation and treatment of infected patients, quarantining of all people exposed, temporary closure of non-essential workplaces, including schools, provision and mandating of masks in public places, mass vaccination programs and stricter travel restrictions. The fact that China suppressed the highly infectious Omicron BA2 subvariant using these basic public health measures reaffirms in practice that elimination is both possible and necessary. If the above measures were implemented on a world scale, combined with the improvement of ventilation and filtration systems, COVID could be eliminated globally in a matter of months. As the CFP has insisted, the fight for the safety of teachers, students and parents requires a political fight against all of the government's education departments and teacher unions. The struggle must be linked to a fight for the repudiation of the profit-driven let it rip policies with guarantee, which guarantee a continuation of mass infection, illness and death and the emergence of new variants. Thank you. Thanks very much for that report, Carolyn. I should have raised this earlier, but while our speakers are giving their reports, if questions emerge that you want to raise, feel free to type them into the chat box while the issue comes up and we, we can come back to them later. Uh, otherwise, you can save your question for, the, for that period of the meeting. Uh, we will now move to the final uh, report today, which has been given, as I raised, by Renee Casameda from the United States. Uh, we're very pleased that she's able to uh, join us in California, where it's now uh, Saturday evening, her time. Uh, Renee, <coughs> excuse me, Renee is a history and English teacher, uh, as well as a member of the Socialist Equality Party in the United States. She's also a writer for the World Socialist website. In addition to all of that, she is a leading member of the West Coast Educators Rank and File Safety Committee, uh, which is a rank and file network of rank and file committees of educators on the West Coast of the United States, which has fought to mobilise educators there against the COVID threat to teachers and students independently of and, and opposed to the teacher unions, uh, which like here are in the United States entirely complicit in the mass infection drive. So I'd like to welcome Renee. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patrick and, and Sue and Carolyn and others uh, for inviting me to today's meeting um, and also for these really excellent reports, uh, really outlining the treachery of the unions at the hands of the state um, and also the, the real implications of the, the COVID-19 pandemic that is ongoing uh, and, and, a, and outlining really a way forward uh, for educators, for youth uh, and workers, um, not only in Australia, but internationally. Um, I'll be speaking today a, a bit briefly on, on the crisis of public education in the U.S., its relationship to the entire social and political crisis of capitalism. Uh, there are a number of parallels uh, to the conditions uh, that exist in Australia's public schools, which we just heard. And we insist that there's, uh, this is an international phenomenon uh, and requires uh, an international solution. Um, here in the U.S., educators and students are now every day experiencing a collapse of public education. The last uh, school year has been one of utter crisis for tens of millions, defined above all by the homicidal reopening of schools amid the pandemic, which has led to tens of millions of infections, thousands of deaths, and given the, the real uh, overall cover-up of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the true toll of this is, is unknown. And teachers and uh, uh, support staff are leaving the profession in droves, as, as has also been outlined um, in Australia. Uh, there's an unprecedented exodus of teachers leaving uh, and school workers over the course of the past two and a half years. As you see on the screen, more than 2.6 million educators and school workers in public education in the U.S. have quit from uh, January 2020 to April 2022. 
reports of, uh, you know, high levels of stress, burnout, dissatisfaction, overwork, uh, continued infections, et cetera, uh, continue to be alarming and untenable. And despite the exodus, uh, districts have also continued to slash jobs throughout the pandemic, which um, you see on the screen as well. Uh, an additional 1.3 million layoffs have taken place during this same time period. And a January labor and statistics report notes that there were 567,000 fewer educators, just educators in K through 12 public schools uh, uh, than before the pandemic. So it really outlines a, a, a massive shortage. And now, you know, a, a few months later after January, this number is undoubtedly much higher. The shortage of educators, bus drivers, support staff has left districts reeling. Some districts are, are cutting schools to four days a week, increasing already large class sizes, cutting programs, which uh, special education and preschool programs are the first to go. Uh, school buses being cut, routes being cut, and uh, making parents responsible for their child's transportation. Also here on, on the screen, you see the figure of 1.5 million students in K through 12 alone who have left public education. Uh, we know that 250,000 of those students have uh, gone to private schools and online charters. But uh, what is sort of a question mark is uh, the million and uh, you know, over a million 1.2 million uh, who have left public education. Uh, one can only wonder if this is long COVID homelessness, which has um, skyrocketed in the US. Uh, families needing to move out of state due to cost of living, the inability of parents to drive students to school and so on and so forth. Uh, decades of austerity have left most US school buildings antiquated, unsafe, poorly ventilated, uh, and the spread of COVID-19 is an everyday cons concern. Uh, mass spread is taking place in schools daily. And years of inadequate pay, rising health care costs mean that even teachers struggle to put gas in their vehicles, keep their lights on, especially in light of staggering rates of inflation, which uh, have surged to 8.6%. Um, and just to note here in California, um, uh, you know, average gallon of gas is over $6. A new round of budget cuts and, and school layoffs is beginning as federal COVID relief funds have dried up and schools are left empty handed while the US government diverts trillions of dollars for war. In New York City, the largest uh, school district uh, in the country, uh, the Democratic Party mayor, Eric Adams is cutting nearly $1 billion to schools over the next three years, starting with the $215 million cut next year. Uh, and in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis Public Schools recently announced a $25 million uh, budget cuts. And they're blaming this on paltry 2% raises that were recently, uh, uh, you know, given to teachers and support staff. At the same time, we see a wholesale attack on public education, social life is crumbling, um, the food banks are having difficulty keeping up with demand, people cannot even afford to drive to work, take care of children, um, take their children to school. Uh, and it's from here that uh, in outlining the, the crisis conditions in schools, the deepening and the growth of social inequality for millions in the US, that I, I must also speak to the frequency of mass shootings uh, as a common experience in US schools. A recent horrific mass shooting took place on May 24th in a small town of Uvalde, uh, Texas, in which a gunman uh, killed 19 children, two teachers, at an elementary school. And the recent mass shooting at this elementary school is actually, uh, as you see on the screen here, it's not unique, uh, nor is it uh, to be considered an anomaly in an otherwise functioning society. 
but is representative of a deep pathology of American society, and above all, the inner rot of the capitalist system. And one has to, to ask, uh, what kind of society have we arrived at where mass shootings and thus active shooter drills have become normalized in every school in the United States? Uh, as teachers, we're now trained in every state uh, in active shooter scenarios. It, it varies from district to district, but in essence, we're, we're taught to take down an active shooter, where to grab the gun, how to approach and when all else fails, to use ourselves as a human shield. The police tell us at these training sessions, you and your students are going to die if you don't act, so you might as well die trying to disarm the shooter. We're told to consider ourselves uh, martyrs or heroes. Um, and then we're taught to train our students how to barricade themselves, throw objects, and a whole variety of other tactics. Uh, recently, there was one 11-year-old, uh, one of the survivors at this uh, recent shooting in Uvalde, who uh, played dead to save herself. And one has to just note what a, what a condemnation that students are actually taught how to do this. Teachers are on the front lines of the social crisis, and every day we see so many of our students struggle, poverty, hunger, want, homelessness. Uh, we do as much as we can um, to help, and if this wasn't enough, we have to prepare for our schools being turned into war zones. It's uh, here in the U.S., both the Republican and the Democratic parties uh, as well as all the fake left appendages, such as the Democratic Socialists of America and so-called progressives, who have voted unanimously for a $40 billion war budget to fund mass killing abroad, yet shed their crocodile tears for those lost in the Uvalde massacre. Nothing has been done. From Afghanistan to Iraq, Yemen, Pakistan, Syria, Libya, and now the U.S. has its crosshairs on Russia and is using a humanitarian pretext to pursue its, its military aims. The violence that, that took place at this elementary school is, uh, as, as we have argued, the official uh, is connected to the official violence of the capitalist system and the overall indifference to human life and suffering experienced by masses of youth and working class people, uh, by the ruling elite through its policies and its politics. And one of the ways this has been most acutely demonstrated is through the homicidal policies of the entire political establishment to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mass infection policies started by the Trump administration have been carried forward and even exacerbated by the Biden administration. It's more than 1 million people who have died from COVID in the United States. With the excess death count of another 200,000, the toll is roughly equivalent to all those killed in the country's wars uh, since 1776. At least 200,000 children have lost a parent or a caregiver more than 1,500 children have died from the virus, which is just staggering. Um, and millions of children have been infected, leaving uh, tens of thousands of cases of long COVID. And it must be stated that the forced reopening of schools has played a major role in these horrifying statistics of COVID among children. And schools continue, uh, this was already outlined, uh, to be a major factor in larger community transmission. None of these deaths were necessary. We are uh, falsely told uh, that in opposition to Trump, the Biden administration would listen to science. But from the beginning of the pandemic, the US government prioritized pro profits over human life. Trillions of dollars in so-called pandemic relief were handed to the major corporations and the financial markets. And as a result, America's 735 billionaires saw their net worth skyrocket 62% to $4.7 trillion since the pandemic began, while the misery uh, for the working class continues to worsen. And in other words, you can note this slide here, 
uh, where uh, the scale of wealth accumulation of the 400 richest, Ameri of richest Americans uh, contain $1 trillion in net worth, but 50% of adults can't cover a $400 emergency. And I think a, a last sort of lit major point is the role that the trade unions have played. Uh, Sue really outlined this um, in Australia and a very similar experience has carried, been carried out in the US. Uh, the trade unions themselves have played a major role in carrying out these policies, which despite mass opposition forced teachers into unsafe environments with insufficient protections which have allowed wave after wave of the pandemic to continue. And really at no point throughout the course of the pandemic have any of the Democrat aligned teachers unions sought to rally educators in response to the threat of COVID-19, nor have they sought to rally educators or school workers against mass austerity exacerbated by the pandemic. Just the opposite, in fact, which they helped uh, the government open the schools and continue to suppress opposition among educators and school workers. This school year, we also saw um, multiple major strikes by educators uh, and school workers. You see a couple of which are on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, the top is uh, Sacramento, California. The bottom left is uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. There also were huge walkouts by students, which took place in response to the pandemic policies in the beginning of 2022, and also in response to deteriorating conditions in schools, the attack on democratic rights, and most recently the walkouts to uh, the Uvalde shooting. And on the right-hand side here, you see the top is uh, student-led walkouts um, this was in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, in opposition to uh, the draft opinion of, against uh, abortion rights uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, and on the bottom right, you see uh, students walking out uh, in opposition to uh, the, the Texas shooting. Notably, this is at uh, Oxford High School, uh, where there was a recent shooting as well this year, mass shooting. Um, it's significant that the major strikes that took place in, in Minnesota and California where thousands of teachers engaged in powerful struggles that both were sabotaged by uh, the respective teachers unions who met none of the demands of striking teachers and staff for higher raises, uh, significant raises to, to compete with cost of living and inflation. Um, to combat heavy workloads, the teacher shortages, et cetera. And uh, contract agreements instead forced on teachers and school workers resulted in meager two to 3% raises, one-time bonuses, which uh, actually results in real cuts to wages. And so, again, a very similar experience uh, 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 put forward by the AEU. Um, in the aftermath of these strikes, both are now imposing millions uh, uh, in cuts, both districts, and are blaming the increase in teacher play, uh, pay and decline in enrollment for uh, the mass austerity. And it's notable that the unions accept this. Um, students and teachers cannot continue to bear the burden of continued austerity, death, illness, permanent sensory or developmental losses, um, and further, uh, on behalf of Wall Street and the markets, the Biden administration or the unions, all of these forces have worked in tandem to suppress the organic frustration of teachers and to erase the growing frustrations of students. Every child in America and throughout the world has the right to a public education and each child deserves to pursue that right without the fear of being shot or contracting a potentially fatal or life-altering disease. And every educator should not have to worry about the death of their students from school shootings, which happen with such regularity here in the US. In addition to being unsafe from a pandemic perspective, schools have provided no resources to address the inevitable mental health issues that students and staff and educators are struggling with because of the pandemic and its constituent effects 
Whether students feel safe at school is a secondary consideration to the overriding profit motive of Wall Street and the weapons manufacturers who stand most to benefit from the proliferation of violence within our society. Workers must not accept these murderous policies as inevitable as they are not, and students must not accept lives in which they're afraid to be at school or looking over their shoulders while on campus. In the United States, uh, the network of educator rank and file safety committees uh, like the uh, CFPE are part of a growing movement of worker rank and file committees internationally through the International Workers Alliance of Rank and File Committees, which have been set up with the political assistance of the Socialist Equality Parties and the Fourth International. And since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the Educator Rank and File Safety Committee, um, with the help of the Socialist Equality Party and the World Socialist website, have been consistent in opposing the reckless reopening of schools instead uh, of pursuing zero COVID policies, policies which um, have, we have seen successful in places like China and at an earlier period, uh, New Zealand. Uh, We've had committees set up in Michigan and New York City, in Pennsylvania, in Tennessee, Texas, California, and Washington State as arenas for educators, parents, school workers, and other workers to discuss issues in public education, uh, share information, and organize a united struggle to demand protection for workers, the shutdown of unsafe schools and non-essential businesses and other emergency measures that are necessary to stop the spread of the virus um, and also to oppose austerity and the real threat of war. And it's only through a mass movement of the international working class uh, uh, supported by the youth um, to address the root disease of capitalism, whereas we can bring uh, about an end to these horrors um, that we're really seeing uh, in, in public education and more broadly. Um, I wanted to just end uh, with a, a video. Um, it's just a couple minutes long, but the Educator Rank and File Safety Committees in the US, as well as the youth section of the Socialist Equality Party, the International Youth and Students for Social Equality, IYSSE. Um, we went out to speak with students and, and the students on the call are all high school youth um, on the mass shootings and the political and social crisis in the United States. Uh, we also, um, had a series of regional meetings to really discuss uh, and lay out the underlying causes of of this mass violence here in the United States as well. Um, But I just wanted to play this video uh, and it really speaks to the the growing anger among youth uh, who are really looking for a way forward um, and uh, a a way forward uh, uh, toward socialism as well, which some of these youth are, coming closer to. I think it's scary and I think it's uh, ridiculous that things have been happening for the past 20 years and nothing really has seemed to change and like different tragedies have been happening across America every you know every couple months it seems like and I mean there's there's gun violence occurring every day in America and it's just worrying you know you don't know what where it's gonna happen next it could be in our own communities in our own schools uh, and I think I think that Congress there's a bunch of corruption and a lot of people are fake and they're being funded and I think that it's ridiculous that people can just take donations from these places and get nothing done and nothing's changed. We've definitely spent a lot of money on these wars, we've spent a lot of money invested in police and military and really I think the opposite is what needs to happen. Like people are saying, oh if we just invest more money in the military, if we invest more money in the police, then things will be safer. But I feel like in America, we have a perfect example of like how that's not the case, you know. We have a lot of funding, a lot of spending on police, and still we have places that are unsafe like this. And people think that arming like teachers is going to be a good way to, to solve these issues, and I think that's not at all the case. There's bigger inequality in America than like in during the French Revolution, you know, people would say. And still, like, nothing gets done. I think that... I think that we really need to see that and see that this could be a big issue. And still these billionaires, these big people, they continue to 
rule America basically as if they were like oligarchs. And uh, I think that's definitely one of the big lessons. I am tired of not seeing any action from politicians on this issue. And it's honestly really scary to see them not care and let this continue to happen. But I also think it's connected with uh, capitalism. It's been getting progressively more and more unequal and more and more barbaric as time goes by. Uh, you know, like Rosa Luxemburg said, we're faced with a choice between socialism and barbarism. And I think that's, that couldn't be more true right now. Uh, and yeah, I think capitalism has to be ended. The response to the pandemic has been uh, really bad in the United States. And you know, lots of people who have been affected by the pandemic have not received the economic aid that they need. And a lot of people are going hungry because of it. Uh, so I think overall it's a failure of uh, the capitalist system. Trillions of dollars have been spent in the past 20 years on uh, illegal wars raging in the Middle East and like virtually the same amount uh, of money has been spent, I mean not the same amount, the amount of money that's being spent on education has remained the same. Uh, and we somehow find a way to afford waging wars uh, on other countries and we can't afford to educate our own people and I think that's ridiculous. You have like a mass war going on the other side of the planet, the person all the way over here maybe like in our same neighborhood would be looking at it and they would be they would feel personally affected by it and that's where it all stems from i think it doesn't feel so far away anymore now that we have communication we have social media every like big problem in the world it feels like it affects us for most of us we've grown up our whole lives with the u.s being in a war in that constant state of violence for a lot of people it's desensitized them to the idea that it's an actual life that they're taking and this kind of enables that mindset to be justified with themselves Mental health care is extremely inaccessible to all of America right now. It's extremely not affordable to just most people. People that would be in the mental state to even think of performing this in the first place aren't able to access help. So many times I felt a complete, like, filled with hopelessness, like nothing is ever going to change, but you, ha you that can't stop you. You just have to keep working on it. We are going to, I'm just like, I'm... I'm determined. We are gonna make this country so much better. This is not okay. Like, it's completely, it needs to be stopped, like, immediately. And uh, we're gonna do that because clearly no one else is gonna do it. Because they, they don't. We're not gonna let a group of elites dictate whether we live or die. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Renee, for that powerful report and uh, a really appropriate conclusion, really. Um, striking comments from young students in the United States and Taken together, the report and the video, it underscores the urgency and, and as well as the material basis for the unification of the struggles of not only teachers and educators, but the working class more broadly around the world in defence of our independent interests. So we'll now open up the meeting. Uh, I know there's been some comments uh, and so on put in the chat box. Thank you for those people who've done that. If you wish to ask a question, you can either put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand to speak. Uh, that can be a question in relationship to any of the issues in the three reports. Um, it may be on the COVID crisis, situation in the United States, uh, some of the industrial disputes that uh, Sue referred to at the beginning of the meeting, including from Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, if you would like to speak on the situation in your school, in your community, uh, relating those to the issues that we're discussing today, that's very much welcome as well. Um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. We'll start with Will's question to Renee. Could you give us some insight into the discussion functioning of the rank and file committees established by the Socialist Equality Party in the schools? Sure, I can I can speak a bit to this. Um, well, we'll say that, uh, you know, the, the growth of the rank and file committees in the United States really started at the, um, in the fall of 2020. Um, and this was a, a, a concerted effort in, in following the science uh, that had been emerging um, uh, to uh, really demand uh, the closure of schools, non-essential businesses, um, and really seek to contain uh, the virus uh, we were, uh, our, our committees were, um, again, just really uh, focused on um, uh, following the science, sharing information, uh, speaking with, with educators about this. 
Um, and over the course of the pandemic itself, um, I think the the nature of uh, of these committees has also broadened into uh, the uh, real austerity um, facing educators and school workers, um, and also uh, very much so looking at the broader uh, social and political issues, uh, such as the threat, uh, real threat of war, and the implications that that does have on on workers. Um, we have in various areas, um, you know, uh, work cut out for us. Um, our committees that are in, uh, you know, in, in New York City, um, in uh, uh, Washington, in California, and elsewhere, uh, to uh, to really expand. Um, uh, these are uh, extremely important. We've held sort of regional meetings uh, at this point. Uh, to really gather teachers, workers, um, students, uh, uh, to hold um, you know, real democratic discussions on the pressing issues, um, and then to, to really uh, raise um, you know, the uh, real demands that we present in our, our committee meetings outward to school sites and among youth. Um, so you know, I, I think the, the role of the committees is immensely important uh, these are, uh, for a lot of educators, you know, these are uh, sort of trailblazing in a way um, and uh, uh, pioneering <laughs> sort of uh, groups, um, which are absolutely necessary uh, for educators, uh, for workers um, in uh, really meeting, you know, necessary demands and fighting against uh, uh, the, the ills of, of the capitalist system. So, I do think, you know, yeah, I think the um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we have been able to reach um, a very uh, strong sort of periphery of educators uh, throughout the U.S. Um, and are working to expand it in, in more school sites. Uh, thanks, Renee. I think um, we had a similar question from Campbell on the development of the Rank and File Safety Committees, which I think is covered by your remarks just there, but we may be able to come back to that again. Just to report to the meeting, just an earlier comment in the chat box, again from Campbell, he said, quote, we must now move past the long-held illusion that government and their policing agency, the unions, will fight for your working conditions and wages. The way forward is for us to take independent control of our conditions and form independent rank and file committees, open discussions and input from or by all. Uh, later in the chat box on the discussion on COVID, just Vicky Ferry wrote, I tried to keep my child home from school as I have an underlying condition and my husband has heart disease and diabetes but was told it was mandatory that he attend. My husband now has COVID. I don't know if my son brought it home and was asymptomatic or whether my husband caught it at work. The school has said my son doesn't need to isolate but we've chosen to keep him home rather than risk spreading it to others. My husband's boss told him he shouldn't have gotten a PCR test so he could just continue working. He's been given antivirals. So thank you for those comments. I think um, you know that report from uh, Vicky underscores the issues that Sue and Carolyn were raising about the disastrous you know pressures that have been exerted on all those of the working class with the forced you know reopening in the of the schools and the forced reopening of the economy. I don't see any additional questions or hands up at this point. Again, if anybody wishes to to speak to the meeting, you're more than welcome. If this is your first meeting of the CFPE, but don't. Um, please feel free to add your voice, uh, connect what you've gone through, including I know we've got teachers from Victoria, New South Wales, if you wish to speak on the recent, well, in Victoria, AU sellout, real wage cut, what you make of that uh, issue and our analysis of the way forward in its aftermath, feel free to speak, likewise in New South Wales. We did have a comment on the youth from the United States speaking, and one person raised, sorry, we just got a few comments to scroll through now, one person raising that, well, okay, but these are in the United States. Uh, so do you wish to respond to any of the issues that have come up so far? Yeah, I'll just raise a couple of things, Patrick, thanks. Um, and thanks, Renee, from that really important contribution, um, really painting a picture of the situation in the United States, which is clearly in the most advanced uh, 
advanced stage of decay of the capitalist system, one of the things that Curtis raised was, um, I think in the comments he said, um, well, there's, um, that's the United States. The, the comments by the students were very articulate as they were. Um, but, of course, what we've stressed and what is clear, uh, becoming clear every, every single day, is that there is becoming very, very quickly common experiences of workers in every single country. And those experiences and the economic conditions and political conditions and social conditions that they confront have a real impact on the consciousness of workers and young people. And, of course, you know, what is, um, I think, Patrick raised in his introductory remarks about the situation here in Australia for a whole period, you know, it was always... We're always told that Australia is some exception from the situation. In fact, when the COVID started, we were, you know, able to, you know, go to zero in some at certain stages, and the economic situation is not as bad, and and so on. But of course, that that is changing really rapidly, and. Um, one can see even, I mean, in Renee's contribution, she referred uh, to the billionaires um, and how a whole layer of the uh, financial elite, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and so on, have enormously enriched themselves um, at an ever greater, uh, you know, pace in the last couple of years in particular. And, of course, that process is, has been underway here. We have in Australia what they call the pandemic uh, billionaires, and we just recently um, wrote, um, we wrote an article um, by Max Body on the 4th of June, Australia's billionaires boost wealth at workers' expense during the pandemic. And he, he reports that the, 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 it was talking about the top 200 wealthiest individuals and family, their wealth has soared enormously over the last six months. Um, and their combined total wealth jumped from $479.6 billion up to $555.6 billion since November. Um, and, of course, that's on the conditions where, um, uh, you know, workers' wages, teachers' wages, everyone's wages have been slashed. In my report I referred to, and I think Patrick referred to the situation and uh, now under the Albanese government, um, and already um, <clears throat> we're seeing <clears throat> the cost of living rise, interest rates rise, this is all having immediately a major impact on the lives and conditions of workers. <clears throat> we recently reported um, on the World Socialist website, it was a report on the situation, uh, inflation in the United States, and Renee said that, I think she said it was 8.7%, now being reported um, <clears throat> in Britain of 11%. Um, and in, in a, I think it was a perspective that we posted on the World Socialist website, um, in America, um, uh, because of you know, the price of uh, petrol has gone up when I reported it, and in that article it reported that some workers have to fill up their tank of petrol, cost them $100 um, every other day to travel to work. Now, that's becoming the situation here too. Um, and, and what is being sort of carried out in the United States is kept being carried out here. Um, and the situation is changing extraordinarily rapidly. I mean, we have, had, um, we have thousands and thousands of people that have already, I think 40%, more than 40% already faced uh, financial stress 
uh, through their mortgages and so on. Uh, this is before the, the recent, uh, what, um, uh, recent interest rate. We have, you know, youth unemployment. I mean, they provide figures that are really phony. If you work for one hour a week, you regard as employed. We have, you know, thousands and growing numbers of young people that are coming out of the universities with high debts and no jobs. I mean, everything that the, the young people in the United States are confronting are confronting, beginning to confront here. And, of course, what is particular to the United States, young people in the United States, is, is they have, as they reported, they've grown up under conditions of war, continuous war carried out. And, of course, here we've already seen the Albanese government immediately, Alb Albanese jump on a plane, sign up to the Quad, Penny Wong, um, in, uh, visits to the Pacific um, to prepare for, you know, against war. And, of course, the government here has agreed to $600 billion to be over the next decade or more to be paid out for, for war. So there is, there is a commonality to the situation. This one, I just heard a report this morning which shows the dire situation that workers are now confronting internationally under capitalism and it's the sharpest expression is now on Sri Lanka. And it was reported that in the next week's um, in Sri Lanka, workers are going to, many, many thousands are going to face starvation. And the government has told people in Sri Lanka they should grow their own vegetables so that they don't starve to death. Um, so, you know, we are, you know, we're are in a global economy. There are international processes underway and they can only be resolved internationally and the level of sort of consciousness uh, that was expressed this amongst these young people is as, as similar to what is expressed if you went out in the streets and interviewed students today. So I just, and one thing too, I just, um, on, yeah, uh, Peter raised something about, um, we should say, uh, the AU Vic. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Peter believes that the AU is somehow quite different. Um, in the ACTU, um, which we would clearly argue against, but I would, um, I'll leave, you know, my response there. Thanks, Sue. Uh, your mic was cutting in just a little bit that you might want to just check out before we come back to you again. Um, there's been a few important comments just left uh, on in the chat box, just on the conditions within the schools. Uh, Christy G reports, my school doesn't have one-to-one -one devices, that is computers and iPads and so on. The state government is building a new courtyard for the students to sit in and feel well. The only way I balance my mental health and own well own well-being is on a 0.6 fraction, that is part-time, three days a week teaching, true of so many. Uh, there's no question that's the case. I mean, teachers are increasingly having to impose sort of voluntary self wage cuts via dropping down to part-time status given the impossible demands on, on full-time staff. She goes on to write, the AU is a disgrace and there is significant anger. I am interested to know more about how we structure rank and file and how they may function to disrupt and draw attention to all of the issues. Uh, I'm sorry, she earlier right? As lost, my school has lost five staff so far, found two to replace learning sports specialists are covering VCE classes that uh, they aren't trained in or otherwise no covers. COVID means classes are away in classes, making continuity of teaching impossible. Apologies yeah. if I didn't read that, that out correctly, but I think this teaching uh, staff shortage is having real impact across uh, the country now. Uh, earlier, Terry wrote, I'm responsible for staffing at Virtual School Victoria. I currently have more than 100 students in year 11 and 12 who do not have a teacher for their subject, despite advertising more than 200 positions in 2022 alone. We've had more than 18% increase in enrolments, which have been going up by 10 to 15% year on year for more than five years. Our school teachers and students are victims of the crisis in Victorian education. Thank you for sharing those experiences and issues. 
One thing to share if you're using the chat box is that you're sending your message to everyone in the meeting, not just hosts and panelists, unless you mean to do that. Um, one participant wrote, just went to the hosts and panelists that uh, I was told by our AU rep that if we didn't take the wage rise on offer, then it would be less than if the agreement didn't pass. Uh, that's basically part of the intimidation and threats used by the union uh, as part of their attempt to cobble together a narrow majority. We do have a couple of hands up for people to speak. Uh, John B. Yes, uh, thanks. Well, I'm speaking from uh, Wellington in New Zealand uh, today. I'm pleased to be able to take part in this meeting. Uh, and really, all, all that I want to do is to make some general comments about the situation uh, here in New Zealand to underline the points that have been made that this is really... Um, it's an international issue impacting um, education in every country. Um, as has been mentioned, um, in New Zealand, the Ardern Labor government was internationally well known uh, last year for following successfully following uh, an elimination strategy uh, until October. Uh, in, in October, under tremendous pressure from big business and, in particular, the tourism industry. Um, the, the, um, uh, that, that strategy was, was ditched uh, and, and very quickly New Zealand joined the um, let it rip uh, policy that was being imposed by governments around the world. Now, in, at that point in October, there had been, uh, I think, about 35 deaths registered um, over the two years, uh, nearly two years of, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, as of this week, um, the death rate has now escalated to nearly 1,500, uh, and most of those have occurred uh, in the period since January. Um, the um, country has gone into uh, currently officially in what, what's called uh, an orange uh, which means that there are certain measures supposed to be in place, such as mask wearing uh, in public uh, transport. Uh, it's up, left up to schools individually to make decisions about how they operate. Um, in New Zealand education is, is run in a, in a very devolved manner. Um, the um, sort of school, independent school um, management systems were introduced by Labor in the late 80s. Um, and, and so, uh, my, you know, despite what the Ministry of Education may or may not do, it's left up to schools to make their own decisions about this. Um, the uh, coronavirus is now ripping right through schools in, in the country. Uh, hundreds of schools are grappling with students and, and staff off um, just in the last week, there's been a, a number of articles in the media about how schools uh, can't get relief teachers. Um, their relief teaching budgets have gone through the roof. Um, the, you know, there, there, there is a, a real crisis. Uh, and the schools are very much uh, at the centre of it, along with the health system. You know, hospitals are in the same, are, are in the same situation. Um, so it is a, 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 a deepening crisis. Uh, at the moment, there is a discussion. The, the um, scientific experts are very concerned about uh, the winter. Um, there are, uh, there's a discussion about uh, some, some scientific experts are calling for schools to have a, a strategy in place to get through the winter. Um, but, of course, schools aren't islands. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to establish a sort of a, a, an individual strategy for schools uh, outside of a, a, a wider society where, um, where coronavirus is just being allowed to rip. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be a very difficult winter. Just, I, I guess, by the by, the... Um, Principals, uh, secondary school principals, uh, a couple of weeks ago had had their annual conference in in Queenstown, and it turned into a spreader event, a super spreader event. They returned to their schools carrying COVID themselves, uh, and you know, I mean, they, these are the people who are making decisions about uh, about 
hundreds and thousands of, of school students, um, as everywhere else, um, the, the teacher unions have have been uh, a part of this. I mean, right at the start of the of uh, the, the um, outbreak two years ago, the secondary teachers' uh, president, uh, Melanie Weber, bluntly said, well, schools are safe. Schools are safe places. They were completely opposed to any lockdowns. There were, um, you know, temporary lockdowns that were put in place and then removed um, schools were sent back um, in at the end of January this year, like they were in Australia, uh, and it's been go ahead since then. There have been there's been nothing um, put in place by either of the teachers unions um, to protect the health and safety of of staff and, and students. So the experiences that people are um, going through internationally are, are very much on the agenda here. Uh, thank you, John. Um, Peter, you should be able to, you've got your hand up, you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, thanks. Um, look, I don't disagree with your general analysis, but I think we have to be careful about criticising branches of the union. I'm very involved with the ACT branch of the AEU. And it's a very different beast, the AEU Vic. Um, we have a very active uh, organising model. We have active sub-branches in schools, um, all complete anathemas to AU Vic, of course. I have experienced life as a rank-and-file activist under the AU Victorian branch. I don't know exactly what the beast is. It's dreadful. But um, my experience here in the ACT is a very different one. Um, and I would also, if people are leaving the union, are they coming to you? That's the question. So I'll leave it at that. I would say also that there's 500, over 500 students across 75 schools that we know of that have COVID. Um, and generally speaking, you could say there's probably on an average 20% of staff out across all the system, across each school. Um, in our school, we actually called for a WorkSafe inspection, um, which we got, and we've consequently received a lot of extra support from the directorate, the education directorate. Um, how long that'll last for is a different matter, but... Um, so I think things can be done if you've got an active union, but that's the, that's the um, critical question, isn't it, for Victoria anyway. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, there are important issues contained within your comments there. Um, before I throw to perhaps Sue, uh, there are a couple of other people in the meeting with their hands up. Uh, those with their hands up, you don't need to respond to Peter. You can just raise what you were going to raise before uh, if you wish to do that. Uh, let's see, but Campbell. Can I just say thank you to um, all the speakers today, including Renee, um, most enlightening. Um, I made a comment earlier in the, um, the chat about illusions, um, and you referenced that earlier, Patrick. Um, I've been um, on the um, Oppose the VGSA website, a Facebook page for some time now, um, and... Uh, the the interesting aspect that is unfolding within the context of the agreement and how people are feeling really quite um, angry about the development of um, the conditions and wages within public education, um, I think there is an element here that, and and Peter has touched on it, and I'll I'll reference that in a moment but there is a an a, a belief at the moment that many of the people who are really quite angry about what has happened recently with the AEU in Victoria um, are resigning their uh, membership and many of them are saying well I'm going to resign but I might join later on I just want to register my pro a protest vote and hope that the union will in fact um, reflect on on what it's done and 
um, you know, come back online and, and be very supportive. Um, this is really a, quite an interesting cultural thing. I guess there's a lot of long-time rank-and-file union members who um, still believe in um, the activity of the union and believe this, this particular framework that's up at the moment with the AUU in Victoria is a, is a bit of an anomaly. And I think Peter touched on that, that the, um, the ACT AUU um, is, is a different beast. But I'm, I think the, the conversation that we need to have is that the, uh, historically the unions have evolved and continue to evolve to um, represent the state rather than any, the, any interest that the rank and file have within those unions. Um, we need to move away from this, under, this illusion that if we push hard enough, the union will come back online and, and support us. Um, my school and the school that uh, the, the region that I'm in, um, and I'll reference what John um, B mentioned before, uh, our situation is no different. Um, and in fact, the school principals who um, met recently and having had a conversation with my principal is saying that the principals are very well aware across Victoria that um, this year is going to become quite a watershed year in terms of uh, ongoing illness, um, disruptions to programs, the education programs to, to students uh, is going to be very fragmented, um, that teachers are leaving the profession in, in quite large numbers and have made their intent. Um, it's not happening at the moment, but next year is going to be a year where um, the, the issues that have been um, on show for the last couple of years will finally have uh, an effect and uh, we're going to be finding that uh, schools are going to be run on a, on a much worse set of conditions than uh, what we have seen, that we're not going to get those replacement teachers anywhere near the numbers we need to even maintain the, the agreement. So I am all for the development of rank and file committees, independent rank and file committees. Um, yes, it's going to be a challenge and we do need to reach out to students and parents alike. Uh, it is interesting that in the US, the, the clip that Renee showed, show quite articulate young people who are um, very aware of um, the circumstances. Um, I'm not getting that same set of um, inputs from from where I am, but I think that will continue to evolve, and we need to include students and parents in those ongoing discussions. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Campbell. Uh, Mike. Okay, I just want to take up um, uh, in part the point made by uh, Peter Curtis uh, uh, that there are some differences between union branches. Uh, I think we need to understand. As Rene spoke about, of course, uh, that this is a universal experience of the working class globally. Workers are confronting union apparatuses that represent police forces over them and increasingly have done for the last four decades. You can look at a graph in any country, uh, including here, and see a direct correlation between the suppression of industrial action over the past four decades and the growth of wealth at the top of society. In Australia, for example, the share of income going to profits has doubled since 1983. Now, what happened in 1983? It was the incoming Hawke and Keating Labor government that signed the Prices and Incomes Accords with the ACTU that signified in this country what was taking place uh, in the US and the UK and elsewhere as well, the unions becoming completely incorporated 
into the apparatus of the state working hand in glove with government and employers. Now, unions once represented defensive organisations in a very limited way within the framework of wage labour and retaining the capitalist profit system, they sought crumbs off the table, you might say. But the globalisation of production has torn apart that very limited national reformist outlook. And today in every country, unions work hand in glove with their relatives, you know, with their governments and their employers to make their economy so-called a competitive. That's why you see in America, the Biden administration, and Joe Biden spoke at the AFL-CIO Congress the other day. You know, they need the unions there to condition the working class to increase productivity and preparations for war. And it's very similar here, of course, with the incoming Albanese government establishing a summit, as Hawke and Keating did in 83, to try and uh, use the unions for a similar purpose. I mean, I, I just, I think as Sue said in her report, the deal struck between the Andrews Labor government and the AEU in Victoria is a warning of what is to come across the board under the Albanese Labor government. And we've been charting this on the World Socialist website. I encourage people to look at the articles we've written over the last three weeks since the election on how quickly Labor's slogan of a better future has been ditched, it's disappeared. Now, instead, it's dire circumstances, budget challenges, need to make sacrifices, tough times ahead. And that's why Labor and the unions are needed by the ruling class to carry out this offensive against the working class. Look, I'm a university educator. And our union, or the union that covers us, the NTU, has played a very similar role to that of the AEU. When the pandemic first hit, the union volunteered wage cuts of 15% and the destruction of at least 18,000 jobs to the employers in backroom talks. When that deal had to be was scuttled because of rank and file opposition, the union then proceeded to, to ram similar deals through university by university. And they're now proposing EBAs, which are wage cutting uh, as well. So I, I just think we need to draw some historical uh, lessons. As, as Campbell said, the unions have evolved. Well, in a sense, they've become transformed from very limited um, you know, organisations seeking concessions from the employers, from the ruling class, while keeping workers trapped within the confines of wage slavery, they have become police forces over the working class. Now, I'm not familiar with the exact circumstances in the ACT, but as, as Peter himself said, schools are back in the ACT as well. COVID is rampant. Um, uh, the unions as a whole have allowed this offensive to, to, uh, to develop across the country. Now, educators have been on the front line of this, but it's not just educators. Workers in every section face a similar situation. Now, we all know, just one final point, we, we are now seeing our living standards being torn apart by what is a global economic uh, breakdown. You know, the trillions of dollars poured into the money markets over the past uh, decade, really, since the global financial crisis escalated during the pandemic, we're now being made to pay for that by the soaring of interest rates, compounded by the refusal of governments to, to um, uh, suppress COVID, and of course by the war, which is a US-NATO instigated war against Russia in Ukraine which of course has caused enormous spikes in food and fuel prices. This is not a temporary phenomenon. This is the only future which capitalism has to offer. Now, in order to find our way forward, we have to organize independently of these apparatuses. That means rank and file committees being developed in schools and in networks as is already uh, happening uh, in the US and elsewhere. So I just think we've, we've got to be clear on this. These unions 
are not working class organisations. They're not. They're organisations to constrain the working class. And 40 years of suppression now has to be ended. But that's up to, up to us. Uh, and it means, you know, clarifying the necessity of these organisations, but also the necessity for a program of, a political program that rejects the dictates of the financial elite. Uh, and that's what, you know, our rank and file committees will fight to clarify in the course of their, uh, in the course of their work. I'll just leave it there for now. Uh, thanks, Mike and, and Campbell, for those important points. Look, the discussion is uh, sort of continuing in, in the chat box. If I can just make a few brief points. I think the question of the trade unions needs to be approached uh, from uh, an international and historical standpoint. One, one can't make an assessment of the viability of a trade union perspective based on one's immediate living conditions or one's immediate um, you know, school, neighbourhood, or, or indeed territory. Uh, there's been a whole experience been passed through by the international working class in the last four decades uh, with the unions. I mean, it's not a separate phenomenon that the polarisation of wealth, which you know, Renee touched on in her report, uh, the accumulation of unimaginable, unprecedented fortunes at the top of society and the impoverishment um, of broad layers of, of workers at the bottom of society. And the unions are complicit in that. The emergence of globalised productive relations meant that the unions shifted their role, as Mike said, from being one of extracting limited concessions to one of offering their services to corporations, to governments, in enforcing the greatest concessions, the greatest tax on workers' job security, conditions, incomes. We noted in the... Now, that isn't, we understand that that is not broadly understood either amongst teachers or other sections of the working class at this point. Uh, we noted in the June 3 statement, the Australian Education Union betrayal of Victorian public school workers and the need for rank and file committees. Part of that statement, we noted that... Um, we, we noted the following, quote, numerous teachers have quit the AU and discussed over the latest betrayal. For some others, especially older educators, the word union remains associated with a collective defence of jobs, wages and conditions. This reflects a certain inertia of both language and thought. In reality, the union does not unite educators and school workers, it divides them. It does not fight for improved wages and conditions, but works for precisely the opposite, organising defeat after defeat, end quote. Now, the union sometimes it's put forward in the course of industrial disputes that, well, the union is us, you know, teachers are the union. And that is a false uh, conception. That is a lie that's promoted by the union leadership. The union bureaucracy comprises a different social strata than ordinary workers, than ordinary teachers and educators. And so while you have in the schools education support staff on, on poverty level wages, you have union officials, as we've stressed in the course of this campaign, earning a quarter of a million dollars a year, $300,000 a year. Uh, this is the sort of base income of uh, a whole layer of senior union officials. In addition, so that places them very comfortably within the top 1% of all income earners. At the same time, the unions themselves are tied to finance capital uh, by a thousand strings, including uh, super industry funds, uh, which integrates the trade unions into the apparatus of, uh, well, Wall Street globally, um, you know, the ASX here in Australia and so on. In addition to that, the unions are integrated into the state. Uh, this has been a process that's been evolving now for several decades. Um, I mean, just to deal with the latest or, or the current situation, the, the Fair Work Industrial Laws, uh, the, the core of which was drafted by the former Labor government under Rudd and Gillard, uh, in collaboration with the unions, drafted these laws which basically strip Australian workers of their uh, basic democratic rights, uh, their basic rights under international law to withdraw their labour, uh, to collaborate, uh, to take joint strike action, uh, to take political strike action. Uh, a fair work regime acts as a straitjacket, which the unions serve to enforce and support. Um, and so we don't distinguish between the AU branches in Western Australia or the ACT or wherever else. I mean, the record shows 
as on COVID, uh, on every major political issue confronting educators and school workers, the unions are, are lining up with the government against the, the interests of ordinary teachers. I mean, it's only a decade ago that the unions across the country sold out the struggle against NAPLAN. There was an a organisation, a, an organised uh, boycott that was prepared uh, to boycott the imposition of this new standardised test, which everybody knew was going to be accompanied by a whole degradation of the curriculum, a narrowing of teaching to the test and so on. Uh, the unions across the country sold that out uh, as soon as the government agreed to bring them on board, be part of a working party on that plan. Uh, the union bureaucracy got on board with that process. And so we, we don't uh, offer the solution of sort of getting ourselves in, 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 the, in the place of the current union leadership. Because if, if myself, Sue, whoever else, Mike, were to be elected union, uh, senior union officials, <laughs> we would be entrapped within this whole uh, environment, this whole framework, this whole mechanism. That is what the unions are now. They can't be brought onto the, a correct track by the election of one or two well-meaning individuals. Um, and so that's why there are more profound challenges at stake. Um, and it does require the formation of new organisations of struggle, uh, rank and file committees in each school and, and forming networks of those rank and file committees, uniting the most advanced students, parents, reaching out to other sections of workers who are confronting similar attacks and uh, organising a joint political and industrial offensive in defence of our independent interests. Um, so there are some points that I would raise in response to that. Just finally, there was a question raised by Peter uh, that what, what do we do within sub-branches? Do we just shut them down? Well, no, I mean, I'm a member of the AEU, uh, so is Sue. When we work within our schools and within our school sub-branches, uh, we, we fight to explain. And well, why are we members? Well, we're members because lots of teachers are members of the union. Um, so we work where teachers work. Uh, to the extent that teachers remain trapped within the confines of the AU, well, we, we are there too. But we are there not to bolster illusions in the AU or to, or to suggest that within this framework, some sort of solution can be, uh, can be found. We work within the union in order to fight for the case to break out of the union. Um, so I just make those points. Uh, but I know Sue wants to speak as well. Yeah, it's a very important <coughs> discussion, all sorts of important issues are coming up. And, you know, this was, you know, the purpose of calling the meeting today and all the meetings that the CFPE holds on a regular basis to discuss and work through this, these issues, seek to clarify, you know, teachers and workers and, you know, take forward you know, the development of an understanding within teachers and so on, the need for these rank and file committees. Uh, Jane, I just wanted Jane ask a question about the private schools um, and, and what sort of perks have they got going. Well, just, Jane, if you, um, I couldn't find the article I wanted, but... Jane, when you finish, um, just go do a Google search and put in private school job keeper during COVID. Um, and a whole list of articles come up about um, the money that the private schools have reaped by accessing job keeper. Now, during, during COVID, and just to read a couple of the headlines of the articles, um, this is from WA. A group of 24 private schools in WA, most privileged students have raked in a combined total of 77 million through federal job keeper payments. New South Wales have raked in 72 million in job keeper. Um, and if we go down to Victoria, um, uh, Wesley College, uh, it topped the, and it is the most, you know, here's the most, I think it is the most expensive elite school in, in Victoria. Um, it topped the list of JobKeeper payments with a massive 18.2 million. Um, and in that same year, it made a profit. Um, I'm 
just uh, it made a profit. Uh, Wesley College um, job keeper payments of eighteen point two million in the same year. It made a profit of two point two million, and increased its profit with the help of job keeper by three million after making a loss in. 2019 of 0.8 million. Um, um, you know that. You know, that the private schools, you know, are raked in, and if you, you can access it and find out how much each school profited. This is under conditions where workers. I think they. They've just, well, JobKeeper has been completely eliminated, um, and I think that the whole. You know, the process of funding to the private schools has gone on decade after decade under Liberal federal governments, under Labor governments, under Rudd, Gillard, uh, and, and right across the board. And it, and it will continue. And, of course, one of the transitional demands that we made as a part of the campaign of the CFPE during... Um, these industrial agreements is that the funding to the private school should cease, um, and the and and the should the millions that are poured into the private school system should be you know poured into the public school system. Um, one uh, um, one of the things that we have spoken about is that over decades now. The process has been underway of budget cuts and so on and pouring money into the pri private schools. And what you have a situation now in particular with COVID, with the staffing crisis, with the lack of resources, you know, and so on, is that these public schools have become like holding pens for working class kids and the teachers basically babysitters. Um, and that, that transformation has been underway for a whole period. And, and alongside that, you've had the sort of uh, retrogressive moves of high state testing, NAPLAN, narrowing the curriculum. Um, and, of course, the perspective of the government is basically to provide working class kids in disadvantaged areas, if they're lucky, with the basic skills of you know, the three R's they used to call it, um, where the private schools with all their resources, extraordinary resources, you know, tennis courts, theatres, performance spaces, the arts and so on, has, you know, is something that should be provided for all kids. Every kid should have, have that. I think that um, one of the things that um, Terry um asked about, you know, look, the problem is maybe just the executive and so on. And Patrick Patrick and answered that. There, ha there are experiences, and I know we're running out of time, but th there are experiences within the unions where new left leaderships have been put into, you know, leading the unions. And I'm sure Renee could speak a lot about this. Because in Chicago, they've had the experience of the ISO, so-called socialists, uh, elected to the leadership. And in Chicago, some of the biggest attacks on the public education system has taken place under that leadership. So, you know, what, what people are explaining about is that these organisations, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a question of changing the leaders. These organisations now are completely bankrupt for workers to defend themselves. That's why we're saying new organisations have have to be uh, uh, developed. I think um, I think that you know the, there is um, a lot of other issues that have come up in the course of this meeting, um, and we do want to continue. Um, the discussion. The Committee for Public Education that was established by the Socialist Equality Party is a rank and file committee. It is a sort of uh, uh, overarching centre to develop rank and file committees 
nationally amongst educators, parents and students. And those that are on the line here um, this afternoon uh, that are interested in taking that forward, beginning to understand how that process will take place, we call on you to, you know, um, sign up, give us your details, come to our regular CFPE meetings and, and so that we can, you know, really begin, begin that process. Just finally on the private school system and so on, Australia has one of the most unequal systems, education systems, a two-class system anywhere in the world. There is no other place like it. Um, and, and, you know, it's education for the rich and holding pens for, you know, working class kids. And, of course, teachers here under the worst sort of conditions are trying to do their utmost best to provide kids with the best possible education, but without the resources that are needed, um, that are urgently needed now, because we are, as Renee said in her contribution, dealing every day, kids come into the school and we're dealing with the social and economic crisis um, as the whole capital system decays. I think so. Um, we are going to need to begin to close the meeting. Uh, this has been a really important uh, discussion. Uh, we had three very helpful reports and then a lively uh, question and answer discussion and, and important contributions uh, from different uh, teachers and, and others attending these meetings. So we're very appreciative of everyone's contributions. Uh, it is unfortunately getting late in California um, and also no doubt many of you need to do unpaid overtime in preparation for stepping back into the classroom tomorrow. Before we conclude, I would like to make two final announcements. Before I get to those, I'd just like to add to what Sue's just raised. Before you leave the meeting this afternoon, please uh, leave your contact details if you haven't already. Um, you can send that via the chat box. Just change uh, the blue toggle from everyone to host and panellists and let us know what your email address and phone number is so we can continue the discussion let you know about upcoming uh, meetings. All right, I would like to just make one announcement in regard to Mering Books. Just alert everyone to a new publication. Uh, Mering Books has published this important new book called Pike River, The Crime and Cover-Up, The Fight for the Truth About How and Why 29 Workers Died in New Zealand's 2010 Pike River Coal Mine Disaster. Uh, so this is authored by Tom Peters, who's a writer for the World Social website. It deals with the many important political issues raised by a 2010 uh, mine explosion in New Zealand and the subsequent uh, betrayal of their families, um, including by the Adern Labor government, as well as the mining unions in New Zealand. Uh, so that's just $5 if you wish to purchase it as an e-publication. You can get that via mehring.com.au, that's M-E-H-R-I-N-G, uh, or if you wish to order the paperback book, that's $22 plus postage. Um, again, can be ordered online via Mary. This second publication is Marxism and the Trade Unions by David North. Uh, this very much relates to the discussion which we've just wrapped up. Um, it deals with the historical and theoretical uh, issues involved with the working class's relationship to the trade unions. Uh, it deals very concretely with the history of the trade union movement, both in Britain and Germany, um, and despite the sort of different and complex histories in both of those countries, the trade unions as internationally are playing the exact same role on behalf of big business and finance capital. So if you're curious, if you'd like to know more about our analysis on the trade unions, um, I would very much encourage you to buy that pamphlet. It's just $5 plus postage, again, via mehring.com.au. The uh, final announcement I would like to make is in a relationship to uh, the election fund of the Socialist Equality Party. Uh, the Committee for Public Education endorsed the election, federal election campaign of the Socialist Equality Party. Uh, the Socialist Equality Party stood uh, candidates in the last election in order to provide a genuinely independent socialist alternative for the working class. The SEP was the only party that addressed, let alone provided the answers for, all of the burning issues confronting the working class in Australia and internationally. The intensifying danger of a catastrophic world war, the unchecked spread of COVID-19, the relentless slashing of real wages and social services, soaring social inequality and poverty, 
and the disasters generated by global climate change. And our campaign was above all aimed at providing workers with a political and organisational means to fight for their interests, including through the formation of rank and file committees like the CFPE. Now, in order to contest the election, we were, uh, prior to the election, we had been deregistered by the Australian Electoral Commission due to deeply anti-democratic electoral laws that were jointly ran through the parliament by the coalition and the Labor Party last year in order to try to stifle dissent and oppose uh, parties other than the, those within the political establishment. Despite the challenges confronting the party, we did stand in the Senate in three states, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, we stood two candidates in each state. For each single candidate, we had to pay $2,000. Again, these financial impositions are geared towards keeping uh, rival uh, parties and candidates off the ballot paper. Uh, our election campaign also involved many other expenses, you know, travel, campaign materials, uh, publications, uh, media work and so on. Now, all of that had to be resourced through our election fund, which was raised exclusively within the working class. Uh, the SEP does not uh, enjoy uh, the patronage of big business uh, or state financing. Um, so we're now seeking to close our election fund. Uh, and so I urge you uh, to make a pledge uh, to the election fund. You can do that within the chat box. Thank you for those people who've indicated additional donations. Uh, those donations can be made via uh, the sep.org.au forward slash website, forward slash donate uh, website address. Uh, if there are any international, excuse me, there are international uh, participants at this meeting, you can, you need to donate via the World Socialist website at wsws.org forward slash donate. So thank you again for those people who've indicated in the chat box you're willing to support our election fund, support a genuine socialist alternative against the major parties. Obviously, our election campaign was not just geared around securing votes. Uh, we were seeking to develop the initial, uh, develop our election campaign as the initial step in the necessary fight that, that continues after the election, uh, taking forward the political organisation of the working class against this Labor government and its attacks on the working class here. So with that, I'll bring the meeting to a close. I would very much urge everybody before you leave the meeting to have a skim through the chat box click on the different links to articles and material that, that different people have put. Uh, you can bookmark those, read them later at your leisure. There's important statements, articles, links uh, that different meeting participants have put. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone to just click on those so you've got them in your web browser before you leave the meeting. Finally, and most importantly of all, I'd uh, urge you to give serious consideration to the political issues that we raised this afternoon. Uh, join the ranks of the Committee for Public Education. Um, and learn more about the Socialist Quality Party. Read our history and program, including our statement of principles, which as you can see there, you can order via Mary Books. And on the basis of an understanding of our history and program, make the really critical decision to join our ranks and build the Socialist Quality Party as the new party of the Australian and international working class. So thanks everyone for your participation. Thank you to the presenters, Sue, Carolyn, and above all, uh, Renee, thank you so much for participating from the United States. But I wish everyone a good afternoon. I look forward to further discussions in the future. Thanks again.